Ladies and gentlemen, our program will now begin. Please welcome the CEO of the Churchill Club, Karen Tucker. Speakers, all of whom are former Amazon execs, we have Dave Cotter of Square Hub, Dave Selinger of Rich Relevance, also known as Selly, Nadia Shurabura of Pointer, and Christina Wallander of Ticketfly. And here to lead them in conversation is Brad Stone of Bloomberg Business Week. Welcome and thank you all very much for being here tonight. The genesis of this program is Brad Stone's critically acclaimed new book called The Everything Store, Jeff Bezos and the Age of Amazon. The discussion that we are about to hear is not just about what makes Amazon great, but also how Jeff Bezos's unique style of management might be applied elsewhere in business and in particular to startups. A big thank you to our member, partner, and sponsor, Bloomberg Business Week, for making this event possible. There's a copy of the latest magazine here for all of you, and we hope you enjoy the content and unique style of writing just as much as we do. We learn a lot from every issue. Please join me in thanking Bloomberg Business Week. A brief introduction to Churchill Club for our new guests in the audience. We are Silicon Valley's premier independent technology and business forum. And what drives us every day is to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. We've been convening unique Silicon Valley conversations since 1985. We do up to, say, 40 programs each year where like minds can come together around a topic of interest and learn and meet one another. We're a member-supported nonprofit organization and we welcome you to join, participate, and get closer to the extraordinary conversations that we convene here on a regular basis. We have a few more events for you before the year ends. Next up is a conversation with Pam Fletcher, Executive Chief Engineer for Electrified Vehicles at General Motors. That is on November 13th. And we invite you to visit our YouTube channel where most of our programs, recordings are there that you can watch free of charge. If you are tweeting tonight, please use the hashtag Churchill Club and you'll find other Twitter codes in your printed program. Our moderator, Brad Stone, is a senior writer for Bloomberg Business Week and the author of his second book, as you know, The Everything Store. He has covered Silicon Valley for a number of prestigious publications since 1995 and is well known and respected for his work and a great journalist of some detective in them as well, and I'd rather see Brad as having a very healthy dose of that. For instance, it was Brad who uncovered the identity of fake Steve Jobs, an elusive blogger who, in spite of many people trying to track him down, managed to remain anonymous for almost a year until Brad revealed his identity. And the secrecy of companies that Brad writes about such as Amazon and Apple, sometimes require exceptional sleuthing to get at the story, and we think he does a marvelous job. We're looking forward to the conversation that he leads for us tonight. Please give your warmest welcome to Brad Stone. Thank you, Karen. I'm just gonna stand up for a moment and say hello to this part of the room. You will not be able to see me as I'm hiding here behind the podium. Uh, over the last two years, I took a journey not just into a company, but really a country, the country of Amazonia. And I, I thought I was familiar with the story of this country, you know, two, two guys in a garage in 1994, you know, all the way through the dot-com boom, the dot-com bust, an incredible revival, and now a company with 100,000 employees, you know, fulfillment centers all over the world, really, changing the way that we shop and the way we read. What I found so surprising in my research was the customs of this company. Narratives, OP1, OP2, OLRs, metrics meetings. And 
as I finished my research and wrote the book, I, I was thinking, you know, how applicable are these customs elsewhere in business? You know, what can we learn from a Amazon? And so as I was putting together my book tour and thinking about the different ways in which I could, you know, talk about the book and create discussions around the book, I thought, wouldn't it be great to find some former Amazon folks who, are, who have started their own businesses or are helping to run startups and to talk about you know, what, wh which of the lessons uh, from this formative experience they're using. And, and I went to these four folks, and, and, uh, and, and that is why we are before you today. Uh, so um, I would like to start off by just asking each of you guys to introduce yourselves and to talk a little bit about what you're doing now. And we can start with you, Dave. Sure. Uh, so my name is Dave Cotter. I'm the CEO of Square Hub, which is a uh, social network dedicated to families. So kind of picture a path or a Facebook uh, dedicated towards families and uh, including kids and we're about four months into our launch and uh, I have several uh, Amazon current sitting executives as investors so um, I better watch what I say. <laughs> which actually just, is... <laughs> it's just a disclaimer. Right, well, we'll see about that. But um, it's, it's unusual actually. Amazon executives haven't uh, been traditionally known for their angel investing and Dave has gone and managed to line up a pretty incredible uh, lineup of, of Amazon folks, including Jeff Wilkie, right, the mm -hmm. senior vice president, and Rick Dalzell, the former Amazon CIO. Uh, and now for uh, purposes of avoiding confusion, our next panelist will be going by his nickname, Selly. That's fair. Tell us, uh, tell us about Rich Relevance. So I'm the CEO of Rich Relevance. Rich Relevance is uh, what would be probably categorized as a big data startup. We, we help retailers leverage their data in real time to do what Amazon does and, and present relevant offers and uh, products to each individual consumer in real time based on what their preferences are. Uh, we're about 270 employees about seven years into the journey and work with everybody from Walmart and uh, Office Depot to Neiman Marcus and JCPenney. And Nadia. Uh, my name is Nadia and I'm a founder and the CEO of company Pointer. And what Pointer does is um, after many years with Amazon, uh, I've done all my shopping online. I bought everything from Amazon.com, and uh, everything worked great until we started to launch apparel. And when I started to buy apparel on Amazon, it was good, but it wasn't great. And I was looking worse and worse and worse, and I hated that. <laughs> and so I thought about uh, a way that people would like to shop for apparel or for items we want to touch and feel. And uh, I thought that two-dimensional e-commerce is just way too limited. And uh, I thought about the beauty of stores and the ability to touch items and try items on and uh, have fun while doing that. And uh, so Pointer is changing the way people shop within stores. And Nadia, remind me, or is Amazon an investor in Pointer? <laughs> 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 I, have a, I, have a, I have a theory that maybe uh, Hoiter might be uh, experimenting on behalf of Amazon. It's probably incorrect, but um, what is Amazon an The only statement I can make is that Amazon is much, much better dressed companies these days because all of them are shopping at Hoiter. <laughs> so, so once again... financing it in that way. Thank you to them. Once again, I find that response uh, not inclusive. <laughs> yeah. There's wiggle room there. Christina. Uh, hi, my name is Christina Wallander. I'm head of marketing at Ticketfly. Uh, it's a ticketing and digital marketing platform for live event venues and promoters. We actually ticket uh, more uh, live event venues in the Bay Area than anyone else, so you may have purchased tickets with us. Um, and you know, what's exciting for me about Ticketfly is you know I'm part of disrupting you know yet another industry that's been dominated by an incumbent, Ticketmaster, who's woefully out of touch with consumers. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Christina, let's start with you now and go back through the panel. Tell me, um, you know, roughly, uh, you know, how long you were at Amazon and how formative was that experience, you know, in the context of your overall career? Yeah, uh, well, I was at Amazon for a total of six years. I was in both the uh, retail and advertising teams there. And, um, I mean, Amazon was an incredible period of learning in my life. Um, you know, Brad actually mentioned this in his book, and a lot of friends said it while I was there. You know, Amazon at times feels like a great Darwinian struggle for survival. And there were definitely days when it felt that way, but I think mostly I was proud just to be a part of it all. 
Um, you know, I think if, for me, Amazon changed me. It was, you know, formative business training. If people ask me where I went to business school, I'll often say, well, you know, I got my MBA from Stanford, but I got my PhD from Amazon. And, you know, I feel like six years, you know, may have earned me that. It certainly required the level of biblical devotion that you would, you know, approach a PhD dissertation with. Hi, I'm Nadia. Yeah, uh, I think Amazon changed me in a very profound way. Uh, when I joined Amazon, I was always on the IT side. I was technologist, I was a mathematician, but I never owned business in my life. And uh, uh, when I joined Amazon on the first day, um, Jeff gave me business to run. And uh, I was really bad at it. And I totally messed up his peak. And uh, he yelled at me every single day through the peak experience. And I was absolutely sure I'll be fired by the end of it. But he didn't fire me, he actually promoted me. And uh, that's how my career took off, and here I am. And how long were you at Amazon? <laughs> I was at Amazon for eight and a half years. And, and your final, your la tell us what your last set of responsibilities were. And at the end, he Jeff put me on his S team, which is a senior leadership team. I don't know what he's thinking about, but I said yes. And by the way, it's no coincidence that we have a panel of, of uh, former Amazon employees. <laughs> uh, to extend my metaphor of the Amazon, Amazonia, the country, there, there are some characteristics of North Korea there in terms of uh, freedom and flexibility to talk about one's experience. So the great thing about our panel here is that they're freer than, uh, aside from Dave and his investment connections, <laughs> A little freer to talk about the experience uh, and the and the and the well, not great even her advantages. investment as well. Well, I, I'm right. <laughs> I'm married to an ST member on Jeff's team, but I'm perfectly all right to That's take right. Uh, we should uh, <laughs> definitely make note of that, uh, Sully. So uh, I will be the the better example of of having been out of Amazon. So I was only there for about uh, two years. Uh, I ran the the R and D team around uh, data mining. And, and I, I would agree, I mean, even in that short period of time, I had a, a very, very transformative experience. I got to report to a bunch of the characters that were in your book. I reported to Jeff, I reported to Udi Mamber, I reported to Jeff Holden, and, uh, you know, that, to, to kind of put that in context, I reported to a, a, an Israeli tank commander and a, a guy who is known for his personal life much more than his professional life, to just kind of describe the spectrum there. and. Um, but then in, at a professional level, uh, you know, I got the opportunity to be, and, and Dave and I were talking about this over dinner, part of something that was bigger than anyone could have ever imagined. You know, when, when Dave was starting AWS, we had great visions for what it could be, but no, you know, realization that that was actually, you know, possible, possible in the real world. And we had a lot of belief that data would be transformative to Amazon's business, but no idea that it would become big data, become the transformative trend of, you know, the middle of the 21st century. Um, <clears throat> so I was there uh, 2007 to 2011. I was the uh, general manager uh, in AWS. There was, uh, at the time that I joined, there were, I think, four of us. So Andy Jassy was the SVP. Uh, Nadia's husband was the general manager. Me, a couple of other people. And it was, um, you know, I, I think Sully made a very good point. I don't, I don't think we knew, or I, see, I didn't know, just how the, the pace of innovation and where it would actually be. I mean, I, I literally look back at, like, just the the AWS website and just even hearing the size of the growth and the number of companies that use it, and it just, it almost doesn't seem possible that at one point there wasn't that many people yeah. around the table and the decisions we were making, just, it's, it's shocking how much of an impact um, they've had. In terms of, um, I guess my professional, personal career, uh, I mean, personally, the counselor says I'm doing much better now. Um, I, I think professionally, um, you know, the, the one thing that really stuck out to me uh, at Amazon, just in contrast to, you know, I'd worked at Microsoft, Real Networks, and a couple of other companies, and there was always this obsession with, you know, whether it was a Gartner Magic Quadrant, like how your company stacked up against the outside world. Where did you plot? relative to who was behind, who was ahead, and uh, a lot of product decisions and trade-off decisions and investment decisions seem to be made based on external forces. And the one thing that I left Amazon, I, I mean, and I don't even think I'm being overly dramatic, I, I kind of don't even remember other companies' names even being mentioned um, in my tenure there. People didn't, you know, you know, you'd occasionally hear maybe like Walmart as it related to say like pricing, but 
you didn't hear about other companies. You weren't concerned or you were not asked to be concerned about what other people were doing. You were focused on what your customers were doing, what they were saying, why they were saying it, the data to support, you know, anecdotes don't work, what's the data? And it was, it was in terms of taking it to, you know, kind of outside, um, it actually has been super helpful in, you know, our startup insofar that, you know, look, we're a private social network. There's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of companies that are, you know, vying for, you know, who's going to be the next great big social network. And, you know, we just actually just kind of say, just kind of, you know, don't listen to it. Don't look, you know, don't really pay too close attention to it and just think about, well, what are our customers saying back to us? And I, if I had not worked at Amazon, I, I wouldn't, I don't even know if it's discipline as much as it is just now a way of doing things, but um, we would not have been as focused on the customer experience, measuring the customer experience um, as we are um, if I hadn't left from Amazon. So that's the one thing that was probably the most you know, impactful besides the counseling. <laughs> I'll, I'll back up that story. This is a fun, an interesting narrative. So I, I went, I, I started Redfin right after I left Amazon, and then I went to, to Overstock.com. And I remember during my interview at Overstock, they'd asked me, you know, Amazon's beating us in these five or six areas, and, and how are they doing it? Are they talking about us every day? And, and I remember telling them, we didn't talk about you guys one time in a single meeting. We're slaughtering you on accident. <laughs> And, and I think that's, and, and, and I'm not being overly dramatic. I mean, this is kind of Dave's yeah. point. They, they were winning by not thinking about who they were killing. They were thinking about where they were going. And, and the roadkill that happened to occur along the way was, was, was uh, secondary. I so, think actually that's true for the area where Amazon was winning. For Amazon, for area where Amazon was not winning, that's not entirely true. Because, yeah, uh, right. for example, in China, where Amazon was not the best, and we had very strong competitors, we certainly watched them very, very carefully, and we certainly learned a lot from them. So I think it's true when you're in a winning position, you don't want yeah. to look at everybody else and be complacent. But it's not generally true for area where Amazon was weaker. So in, in my book, I have a, a great time describing the customs of the escalation emails, the question mark emails. And these are, for folks who don't know, uh, if you're an employee at Amazon, you might get in your inbox a message from either Jeff or another senior manager with just a question mark, one piece of punctuation. And it's usually Jeff, and he's forwarding maybe a, a customer response or a complaint that's been forwarded up from customer service, and he just sends it with one piece of punctuation to, to the relevant employee, and the message is, fix this quickly, and tell us why it was broken in the first place. And so I'd like to, to pose the question to the entire panel. Who, who's got a great escalation story for us? And you still have uh, post-traumatic stress disorder from those. Uh... <laughs> um, well, I don't know if it was an escalate. I, I, I kind of remember the first time uh, it, it happened, and it was um, uh, very, very disturbing. Uh, so I, I, basically, the email came in, and you know, it went to Jassy. Well, at first, it went to Jeff. Then it went to like Michelle Wilson, who was the, uh, Lawyer, chief, the attorney. chief attorney. Then it went to Jassy, and then it went to me. And in each forward, there was no, there, there wasn't anything written. It was just a series of forwards. Just question marks just, piling. Not up. even question marks. It was just forward, forward, forward. And I kind of got it. <laughs> and um, I was, I was kind of new. And I remember kind of asking someone else who had been there a little while, like, you know what? should I respond directly to Jeff? And they're like, oh, you know, <laughs> you poor dude. Like, you know, this happens to people, you know, try not to quit. Um, and uh, what, what was actually, I suppose, good and horrifying at the same time is we, you know, it was a fairly straightforward issue. It was a kind of an, it was an associate issue. Uh, Amazon Associates is the affiliate marketing uh, group. And so it was a customer just had a question but what was interesting is it turned into an entire actual narrative to review kind of a business process or a series of business processes around this particular customer issue. And again, you know, it's kind of the, you sometimes, I'm sure everyone has gotten mails from execs or bosses, et cetera, and you respond to the issue and you're, you're pretty much kind of done. But you know, at Amazon, like Jeff, you're just not done. It's the response is like half of the issue. 
then becomes the, okay, let's break down the problem. How many times can we ask why? And let's pull people into a room and really figure out to make certain that that type of email and its surrounding peripheral never comes through again. Um, and it was, it was, it was, I mean, it's, it was pretty intense. Like it's kind of, in a weird way, it's kind of scary. Like you're, because you know on the other end of that, Jeff expects the, you know, the right answer and his bar is pretty reasonable. All right, <laughs> were, you, were you guys recipients uh, as well of, uh, of the escalation email? Yeah, I'm still in PTSD, I think, as well. It, it went exactly the same way, the question mark with the forwards and lands in my inbox and, and I will m remember it forever. Um, so it was Gilmore Girls, we had an and on cord, which I'll explain in a second, on Gilmore Girls, the complete series, where disc number 24 in the 42 disc set was defective. So, um, and on cord is a really cool program actually, borrowed from Toyota Production Systems. Basically, in that context, if someone on the manufacturing line saw a defect, they could actually pull a physical cord, stop the line, and address the problem. So at Amazon, if the same customer experiences the same issue twice, we actually remove the buy box from the product detail page for that product so that we won't sell a defective or potentially defective product to additional customers. So I won't go into the details of exactly how we solved for uh, the escalation, but what I found crazy was the fact that I lost so many nights of sleep about disc 24 in a 42 disc set for a show that wasn't even that popular by our own sales rank algorithm. And the even crazier thing was that our CEO, a man in charge of a multi-billion dollar company, was also thinking about it. And it just goes to show like the granularity with which Jack so it was came, engaged. So the, the, uh, the question mark came from him? Yeah, the question mark came from, it was kind of, it was a new uh, initiative to kind of dig into and on cords, and in particular repeat and on cords, which was totally the right thing to do. And we learned a lot from the process. I mean, at the end of the day, we came up with a, a new way of approaching when you have like a single disc defective in a multi-disc set and minimizing the costs. And it really was a good thing, but um, it was very painful going through it and troubleshooting it and coming up with a solution. But do you think it was Jeff who was watching Gilmore Girls? Go <laughs> to disc 24 <laughs> and then send you a question mark. It could be Gilmore Girls is a great show, although I have to say, I haven't enjoyed it as much ever since this episode. <laughs> <laughs> So part of what I want to do in this discussion is sort of lead with my chin and, and kind of stress test some of the uh, conclusions in my book. And in the book, and particularly in the excerpts in Business Week, which of course, you know, kind of abstract the, the entire story, you know, I, I present Amazon culture as uncomfortable, as a little adversarial. You know, I mentioned Jeff's concept of social cohesion uh, in the Amazon values, which are posted on the web, you know, which is sort of, you know, being sort of agreeable and civil and, and agreeing for the sake of getting along with your colleagues. And he doesn't like that. You know, he wants people to, as he says in the values, disagree and commit. And I, a lot of people read the excerpts and, and kind of, you know, there was blog posts summarizing, you know, Amazon's a horrible place to work. It's, you know, it's, it's so difficult. Is that fair? Is it a fair assessment of the, uh, the internal culture? Sally? <laughs> <laughs> Sally, lead the charge. So, uh, sure. Um, I'll bite the bullet since you guys were, were there longer and, and obviously have their money in your pockets. So, mm -hmm. uh, Go ahead. Protect, I'll protect you, right? Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I would say, you know, while I was there, there were days that I would go home and, and throw stuff at, uh, at people. Um, and I had roommates for that, and they all worked at Amazon. So, like, we had this kind of good deal. There were four of us. We lived in a, in a little home in, in, uh, uh, just, just outside of Green Lake in Seattle, and we all worked at Amazon. And every day someone would have a complete shit day. And every day we would go out drinking after work. <laughs> and, uh, is this is this what you were looking for? Yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm in I'm in counseling for that. It's a little different. Um, but uh, but I mean we we literally every single day. One of my one of my uh, uh, roommates was on the team that supported the Target and and Toys R Us implementation, which I don't know if you got into that. But you know we'd promised 300 engineers, and there were 20 of them, and so they had to work. Uh, you know, it turns out uh, if, if 20 people are doing the work of, of, of 300, uh, a lot of hours. And so they had, uh, you know, the pager duty, which I know you also wrote about a little bit. And so every single one of, my, of us had pager duty, and we would 
we would literally have these days where the the local bartender um, we had we had one of my my roommates would take a whole pitcher of beer and put it back when he had when he had bad days and so I guess my, my short answer would be yes you know and, and we had really really hard times but then I, I think as I as I also reflect on it though uh, the problems that we were tackling this is kind of what you were saying Kristen it ended up having real value underneath them yeah. right and we weren't we weren't trying to solve things that didn't ultimately matter. And, um, and I remember I was talking to one of the most senior technical folks, so she was a senior principal, which is kind of the, the top of the, the rank there on the individual contributors, and she just wrote down, she walked to my office, and she was having one of these days, and I didn't have beer in my office, and so she just wrote down on a sticky note, she said, when will working at Amazon be less about serving a, um, a tour of duty and more about building a career, and then like slammed the pen through the, through the desk and walked out of my office, and I've, I've kept that little piece of paper my whole life, I have it in my office now, and uh, but I, but the reason I have that is not only because it was so hard and, and that felt so negative, but because it also was so magical at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so, kind of reminding myself that there are these paradoxes in the world that are that are fundamentally magical. By the way, it's great to hear these anecdotes that a year ago <laughs> I would have loved to hear because it would have been great in the book. <laughs> Sorry, my, my PR team pa was a little on me. Paperback <laughs> edition, folks. Um, Nadia, it, is, is do, the culture obviously works for Amazon, right? Is it deliberately adversarial? Um, it certainly is, because I think when people argue, the best thoughts come through. And it makes total sense. If everybody is nodding, and there is a room of people, and decision is hard, and everybody is nodding, it's usually the conclusion is questionable. But mm -hmm. if everybody is arguing and fighting and expressing their opinion and uh, uh, not being afraid to talk, Usually, the decision at the end <coughs> will be the best one. So mm -hmm. it's on purpose, mm -hmm. but why not? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, oh, sorry, go well, ahead. No, it's, it's interesting too, because I think that, um, you know, in a lot of companies, I think when you hear the word adversarial, I mean, you immediately think of like screaming matches or yelling matches. I know like at, you know, Microsoft, it was basically who could, who could scream the loudest, who could throw a Diet Coke can against the wall and make the biggest, you know, impact. But, I mean, at some level, Amazon's adversarial nature, whether it was kind of a, for the most part, it always eventually kind of yielded a positive outcome because there was just such a underlying focus on the customer that, generally speaking, you were all arguing over how to improve the customer experience just because that's kind of how Jeff laid things out, which I think is good. But I do think that, you know, in my, kind of in my observation and friends that I have there, when it's a hard place to work is there's the, there's, there's the positive way to argue and be adversarial, and then there is the defensive way. And if you end up in situations where the culture breeds you know, confrontation or challenging of ideas, and you end up with people who frankly are super, super defensive, you know, whatever they're going through, it, they can take it personal or it, it can turn into something personal and it shouldn't have to. And I do think that because that's a hard thing as a human being just to do on a regular basis to have your ideas kind of challenged, I think that you can end up with people, frankly, with hurt feelings and kind of morale issues time and time again if you don't kind of develop the, the skin or the perspective to go into a meeting and have five really smart people kind of disagree with you. And at some point, somebody says, or it's implied, you know, thanks, tough shit, appreciate your comments, but we're going the other direction. Now, you need to go implement the other direction. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, there were times when I was like, you know, what the hell's going on here? Like, what did I do? It, was, um, it, it, it actually was very difficult for me to, to draw conclusions about Amazon's culture in the book because there's such a variety of experiences. And mm -hmm. I talked to the loyalists who love it and some people who left and went back. And I talked to plenty of people who worked there for six months and ran screaming away. See, and and it, the numbers, the churn numbers, of course, are known only to yeah. Amazon. So ultimately, it's, it's difficult to know whether it's more adversarial. Sorry. But I think it very much depends on a person. Uh, for example, in, um, I think in general, American culture is very polite and very nice. Uh, let me give you an example. If um, you get a letter in America that you're amazing, you, we want you, you're great, but just not today, that means you're not getting a job. 
In Russia, you would get a letter saying, you're a total idiot, but you can start on Monday. <laughs> so that is a difference. And so uh, Amazon is closer to the Russian culture, which is, you're a total idiot, but fine, go ahead and do it. So I think it's just a question of perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity is big enough that it justifies it, right? I think that, that's one of the biggest things is that you can do that if what you're tackling is meaningful enough that you can weed out all these people and that they're, the people that are motivated by solving the problems will take that because they're trying to achieve something great. If you're tackling a market that's a billion dollar or two billion dollar market, you're out, right? You can't get away with that. But they're tackling a hundred billion dollar plus market and they think that's, yeah. that's legitimate. I, I think another thing too that's interesting about the culture is, um, you know, you, you know, if, if, if Amazon were, you know, I don't know, the, the, the Red Sox, for example, you know, you, you can hit a grand slam in the, the ninth or the tenth inning and win the game, and you're going to walk back into the dugout, and Jeff's going to actually say, you know what, you dropped your back shoulder, your swing didn't look as smooth, and the way you jogged around the bases wasn't as tight as I think it should have been. And you know, you're kind of, you could kind of stand there looking at him like, but I just won the game, I just hit a grand slam, see the cameras. But in his mind, and in the Amazon culture, you know, you. You, you end up getting to a point where there's always a better way to do it. And for some people, not getting, or if you're looking for an attaboy or a slap on the ass for doing something good, you're not gonna get it. What you're gonna get is, this is a way to take it to the next level um, time and time again. And I think that plays into a lot of people burning out because it's like, there's no, there's no high fives, there's no attaboys. Um, it's do a better job. Yes, it's an A, get an A plus. Christina, I'll, I'll give you the last word on the culture. Is the, is the discomfort and the churn that results from, from the culture, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Well, you know, I mean, I think a lot of good things uh, come out of the culture. And, and Dave, I really liked your point that in general, I mean, everyone's arguing for the same thing. And I think it's so universal that, you know, you don't really take it personally. But I think, you know, in my mind, like I've seen a lot, the people close to Jeff, actually not Nadia, of course, but many of the people close to Jeff will deliver messages in a way that it's just not necessary. Like, you know, in an OP1 review, the difference between market segment share and market share is apparently in a written document very important. Um, but like, I'm an effing officer of the company, you shouldn't waste my time with this stuff. Like, you don't need to speak to people that way. It's an inherent disrespect, I think. And you know, one of the stories you highlighted in your book, um, you know, which uh, had really touched me when I first saw is, you know, Jeff Bezos delivered this uh, speech to uh, Princeton graduates in 2010, and he talked about this life lesson he learned where you know it's harder to be kind than it is to be clever. And he says, you know, cleverness is a gift, kindness is a choice. And he's so right. But the thing is, the guy knows that kindness is a choice, and I just didn't see him oozing with kindness. <laughs> A lot of people mentioned what they saw as the <laughs> irony of that statement. Uh, okay, so I want to um, I want to change topics now. <laughs> I want to change topics now and ask each of you, um, you know, how you've applied the lessons that you learned at Amazon in each of your businesses. Um, maybe Sully, we'll start with you. Um, you know the, you know the Amazon's unique use and reliance on data. You've, in a sense, with rich relevance gone. You know, created your own uh, you know personalization uh, engine and gone and started to export that to other companies. What's so special about Amazon's use of data? So it's the the absolute would be where I would start. So so there's a there's a bunch of different things that I've learned from Amazon. One is the the and Dave, you mentioned this as well, right? Instinct is one thing, data is another thing. And we used to talk about when I started the the team that I had and we started our first data warehouse. One of the things I worked on. Um, and, and Larry Tesla just left the room with one of his, his direct reports, Diane Lai, who ran uh, the data warehousing group. Which you might want to just, just quickly describe what a data warehouse so is. So data warehouse is where you put your data so that you, everyone can get the same answer as much as possible. And so when anyone asks a question, everyone gets the same answer from, from all the different perspectives. And the, the first thing we did was we tackled um, what, what I called the, um, the brother-in-law over Thanksgiving problem. And one of the, the things that happened every year and, and that I was at Amazon was right after Thanksgiving, we would get all these ridiculous questions about, do customers do this? Because I, I was at Thanksgiving dinner and my brother-in-law was sitting across from me and the S team would like just inundate. This is what my team did, right? You guys got the question mark emails. I got the like brother-in-law said he shops like this. Doesn't everyone shop like that? And we'd run a query and, and you know the good news about the S team was I'd send them a response back and I'd say, he absolutely did do that and so did three other people. 
<laughs> so we are net negative ROI because I just paid a PhD to go run that query and it took three hours. <laughs> Did you have any other questions? Because I'm happy to answer them. And you know, let's go back to the culture though, right? Like what was cool about the culture for me was I, you know, I, I was like a level six employee. I don't remember the, the level. So I was three levels below the S team. Um, even though at some points I reported directly to Jeff, I was still way below them. But I would slap them down with fact and they would not come back. Right? They would not, well, I'm, I'm on the S team, so therefore you need to do this anyway. That, gone. Right? You, you are no longer my problem. I have answered you with fact and you, you are not a problem. And so at Rich Relevance, you know, there's two things, two or three things I've applied. Number one is I think there's, there's a, a real value of a culture that that uh, is focused on what's right. And, and I think, Kristen, you know, we, what we'd say internally is achieve the right result with the absolute minimum amount of force necessary. That's the, that's the cultural mantra we've adopted from Amazon, which is that you can't sacrifice getting the right result. And I think a lot of American com companies sacrifice getting the right result in the interest of being kind. Mm -hmm. So we start with you have to get the right result, and then you have to be as kind as possible to do it. The second one is trying to proliferate the concept of using data as an absolute decision maker and an arbiter of, of, um, of politics, essentially. And then the third one is uh, bottoms up innovation. Data also enabled us to have a lot of bottoms up innovation. And, and, and one of the things that um, I, I was particularly um, changed by was uh, I brought in a, a business idea forward to Jeff in 2003, which was to show more advertising on Amazon's website. And, uh, and he, you know, thanks a lot, to your guys' by point. The way. Yeah, I know. Uh, to, to, to your guys' point, he was very subtle in the way that he told me he thought it was the dumbest idea any of his employees ever brought to him, and he was not quite sure why I worked at Amazon. And um, I think it, he may have said that four, four or five times, too. Um, and, uh, and yet, my team had gone to the trouble of building statistical models that proved that it would be profitable. And so even though he thought I was dumb, and he thought the idea was dumb as well, he still let me do it. And this is kind of to your point about that was my Russian letter. You're an idiot, but go ahead. That's exactly right. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Now I'm having PTSD, right? <laughs> and, so, and, now, and now, of course, there's lots of advertising it's, on the it's Amazon. A, and it's a billion dollar profit right. business. High margin. Yep. So. Nadia, what are, the, what are the strands of Amazon DNA that have made their way to Hointer? I think the biggest one, and that is a gold mine, is uh, uh, thinking from customer backwards. It's, it sounds so simple, but, but it's not. And so what Jeff taught me over years is to think from customer backwards. So when I started my business, I've done a very simple thing. Uh, I've done exactly what he told me to do, which is I went to the traditional store, a very high-end apparel store, and I looked at the experience from customer backwards. And if you break it down, it's absolutely horrible. You come to the store to buy a pair of jeans. You have to dig through a pile of clothes. You don't know if they have your size or not. You pull it out. You schlop all the way to the fitting room. You cannot find the fitting room. <laughs> you found a fitting room. You're in the fitting room. You put the darn thing on, it's too small. What do you do? You have to go all the way out on the floor, find a different size, go all the way back. It is crazy from the customer experience perspective. So uh, the way I build my business is a gold mine. It's from looking at shopping experience in a store from customer backwards and taking it and breaking it down, looking at all the nuisance we have to do in a store and getting rid of it through the simple technology solutions, very simple ways of doing it. And it's, uh, he, told, he taught me the gold mine. Amen to that. <laughs> Christina, it, it, was, it was amazing to me, uh, particularly in the early years of Amazon, how much you know, rancor there was around marketing. Yeah. Jeff just wanted, he didn't, he was so impatient with conventional forms of marketing. And I, I make a joke in the book that the early marketing VPs at Amazon were like the drummers in Spinal Tap, right? They, they just, <laughs> <laughs> Spinal Tap, they, they die, but at Amazon, they just, they were shown the door. And there are a number of them. You know, what, what was going on there? Why is he so impatient about the usual way of doing things when it, when it comes to marketing. And then what did you learn from that and what are you applying now in your job? 
Yeah, well, it was interesting. When, when I started at Amazon, marketing was a, a dirty word. It's so dirty, in fact, that we called it traffic. So what would have been a marketing team in any other company was the traffic team. Um, and I remember it was like probably, well, one of my first all hands, maybe 2006, and uh, an employee raised her hand and said, well, Jeff, you know, I see our, our competitors, Overstock actually was one of them, uh, you know, I see them advertising on television and in display ads, like, you know, why aren't we doing that? And his answer really struck me. He said, well, advertising is the price you pay for an unremarkable product. So, uh, but anyway, a lot has changed since then. Yeah, he's and advertising a lot now. He's advertising then. a lot now, which is interesting, but I did write that down in it's my, because in my notes. because the product is not remarkable. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I think the Kindle is pretty outstanding, but I think what, what happened, you know, behind that is, you know, essentially Jeff made a database decision. Like, he changed his tune when the data proved otherwise. But it is interesting, yeah, all of the Kindle ads that we see now on television or, you know, and yeah, I've seen them on YouTube as well, so things have really changed. But, um, you know, I think uh, as I was making the transition from Amazon to Ticketfly, I was actually trying myself to distill down my learning into a set of, you know, actionable takeaways that I could bring with me. And I came up with an acronym for myself so I could remember them. Uh, so the acronym is MAFT, uh, Measure, Automate, Focus, and Test. And so for each one, uh, kind of like Dave, I, I took my favorite quote from Amazon and I made it a mantra for myself at Ticketfly. So for measure, it's what is measured is managed. So uh, when we have you know, a question about a problem or we think about an opportunity, let's measure it. What is measured is managed. Um, and around automate, this is one from Jeff Wilkie. Actually, it, it stuck with me. It's one of my favorite quotes. Um, Don't let humans do things technology can do better. And so this is the standard response anytime you, know, you try to solve a problem with a manual repetitive task. Um, and for focus, another Jeff Wilkie one uh, is focus on the inputs. So like at, at Ticketfly, we have aggressive goals around increasing gross ticket sales, but you can't just go in and turn the dial on gross ticket sales. I wish you could. Uh, but what you can do is drive the inputs, which are you know, traffic to our network and conversion. So at Ticketfly, we focus on the inputs. Um, and then lastly, for test, you know, when in doubt, test and let the data decide. And I think really that's how uh, Jeff ultimately came around you know, to marketing and other you know, more traditional forms of advertising. We tested and the data proved that it worked. So Dave, you were witness to what has to be one of the most remarkable leaps in business history, the creation of AWS, the moment where an online retailer spawns an enterprise business that actually ends up revolutionizing Silicon Valley. What, what did you learn from that? And is, is there anything you know, in that, it's not really a pivot, in that leap that you can apply in your startup today? Um, well, I mean, I think that, so there, there were four things that kind of stuck out to me as being applicable, and maybe others, I mean, will be down the road. I mean, there's only, f you know, we have four engineers and myself, so um, uh, but two of them were, were certainly hit on. I mean, I think that first and foremost, working backwards, in our case, since we were a consumer-facing app, we actually started with a press release before we wrote code. Um, and it was which actually, explained it as, as an Amazon oh, which is an Amazon style. kind of narrative style. So one of the things that you do um, really before you get any funding or resources to go off and work on a new project, you essentially write a press release um, as if you are announcing the availability of this product or service directly to the customer, um, and that kind of goes goes hand in hand with your narrative, which you know um, details your business. And the the exercise is actually very. It's a pretty rigorous exercise because you're forced to actually put what invariably is either something very technically or something a small group of people are excited about and putting it into customer speak, putting it into a series of benefits or value statements and even kind of a positioning, uh, positioning set of positioning statements uh, for a customer to react to. Um, and so one of the things we did <clears throat> very early on before we'd written code is we actually wrote a press release for what we wanted uh, Square Hub to be. So that was actually, um, it was super helpful. And it was actually super helpful to talk to investors because I could actually talk to them in a customer facing language as opposed to have them try to make the deduction of what it is we were doing. Um, certainly the metrics, I mean, it's just, you can't, I mean, the data doesn't lie. You just, you just have to measure stuff, measure uh, what is managed, I think makes, um, all the sense in the world. The other thing too that Christina hit on that we focused on in particular as a startup 
um, and that is the input. So one of the challenges I think with a small company is you know, you can't say, hey, I'm going to go hire a PR company and we want to have 50, you know, 50 articles. You know, they can't control that. And it was interesting, the, the PR firm that, or lady that we're working with, um, I actually said, hey, we're not going to focus on outputs. We're going to focus on inputs. We're going to focus on how many pitch mails you actually send out, how many phone calls you make, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, okay, this is, this is not how... This is not how PR, you know, kind of works. I'm like, yeah, I come from Amazon, so I'm different. Um, <laughs> but I think that the input, uh, the input component as it relates to startups, because so much is out of your control in terms of what the end game is going to be, whether it's downloads, whether it's, you know, press hits, etc. Focusing on the inputs, um, I think, is a really, really great exercise for especially early stage startups to focus on because, you know, there's not clearly, you know, much in your control. And then the last thing is, um, frankly, it's operational excellence. And this was, um, you know, it was obviously a very big mantra within AWS, but really throughout Amazon, and that is, look, you know, if it takes you a week to engineer something that scales a little bit, and it takes you three weeks to engineer something that scales a lot, why don't you take four and make sure you actually do it the right way. You know, think about redundancy, think about, and even if it's not a full implementation of your, your eventual vision, the thought that you're trying to architect something that is supposed to have an uptime measured in multiple nines as opposed to good enough um, is, is something that is interesting and it also forces you to think about a set of operational metrics. It's so easy, you know, when you're looking at your business to say like, you know, how many downloads, what's the customer engagement, et cetera. But, you know, at Amazon, the way they viewed operational excellence is you have a dashboard for the technology. You know, how fast are things happening or traveling through the system? What is the uptime? How many, and that's, that's just not something you hear a lot of companies do. And, but they're things that actually I think are very applicable to any company, whether it's a startup or small. So those are kind of the, the four things that stuck out to me. Sully, um, <clears throat> I, I wonder a CEO of Rich Relevance, either deliberately or subconsciously, do you ever find yourself channeling Jeff, saying something that he would say, or not, I'm, not, I'm not, perhaps not the maniacal laugh, but uh, his, his style. Um, so, so probably the laugh is, is the worst thing that I've, I've carried with me. Oh, you, um, you, you, you yeah, caught the laugh. Bad, is it contagious? Is bad. it like so, a... So I sat like 25, 30 feet outside of his office, and, um, and it, was really, it was really bad. I'm just, <laughs> just going to leave it at that. Yes. And, and it is still very bad. I have a whole wing of my office that no one else comes into because it's loud. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Any other sort of leadership? Any positive things or leadership things, <laughs> no, for example? Yeah, or, or, um, you know, or, or things that he said you find yourself kind of repeating? You, you know, I, I think the, the maniacal focus on the right answer is something that I, I had a bit of it before I went to Amazon. And as I've reflected on my different experiences and different managers, Jeff's willingness to ask the same question and to, to do something that's really uncomfortable and, and say, you didn't answer my question, answer my question, and, or, or you know, maybe not that directly, actually you just ask the same question again and again and again and again, um, and, and in such a, an uncomfortable way as to not choose new words when he asks it again, to make it clear that you are not answering the question. Um, I found that to be, it, it, it's, it saved me. I mean, it, it, you know, in the same way that, that he gave you kind of the key of, of your business. There, I went to a business where I had 15 competitors in the United States when I started, and they were all better funded, and they were all further along than I was. And I gave my team two years to catch up and take first place. And we were able to do that by just maniacally focusing on out-executing every step of the way. And so I think that's, that's something I definitely thank him for. Nadia, do you find yourself channeling Jeff? I know Hunter is small right now, but. Um, I, I think in a past life, if there is a past life, Jeff was a Russian mathematician because that's how he thinks. So I always found it very easy to understand how he thinks, and it's very similar to the way a Russian mathematician would think. So I think that way all the time, every day. And do I replicate him? Absolutely. So Dave, we were talking a few months ago, and you said something that stuck with me. You said the, the farther away I am from Amazon, the more impressed I am by it. And I'm wondering, why you, why, you, why you think that? And let, then let's ask the rest of the panel, do you agree with that? 
people? Well, because I was, I was traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I'm starting to recover. Um, I, I, you know, I guess what, for, for me, how that kind of embodies to me is that the more companies I see, the more individuals I work with, the more, just, just all of that, I realize, A, how talented actually the people were at Amazon. I mean, it's not like they just they were good. There were some, there were some absolutely brilliant and, and phenomenal employees there in terms of just pure IQ and ability to execute. You, you see in other companies or you work at companies where you see kind of ebbs and flows in terms of the, the pace and the aggressiveness by which they innovate on behalf of the customer. And you just look back and you know, I'm kind of amazed that like, they have kept up a pace and have ramped a pace of innovation on behalf of the customer across multiple businesses that is just, it's just mind boggling. I mean, you know, like they, they, it's not, they just never, never take your foot off of the pedal. Um, and, and the last thing that's just been really, really impressive, and I, 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 just, I don't know if we've ever seen this in terms of a, a high-tech CEO, and that is, you know, one man's, frankly, ability or will to either cannibalize an existing healthy business or take a risk that just doesn't seem to, like, make any sense. And, I, you know, the Kindle is probably too easy of an example, but, you know, just the, you, you have the books market. <laughs> You know, you have now introduced a electronic device that has now put you into the hardware business. You have elected to disrupt relationships with publishers that you have nurtured over multiple years. You are cannibalizing your, you know, your margins. You are invest, like, his, when you look back at that, like his ability to like place bets that directly are in what appear to be business conflict with other groups that are, you know, highly necessary in terms of the cash flow, you know, you're just, it's just impressive. I, I like I was telling you last night, like I, it, to me, I think it's the, one of the most, probably the funniest part of the book. The thing that just kind of made me laugh was the fact that Amazon owns the domain relentless.com. I, I mean, I almost, I almost put the book down and just like, <laughs> Fuck it, I'm done reading. So if you, I got enough. <laughs> it's, so if, you, if, you go, if you go to relentless.com today, it was a name that Jeff considered back in 1994. And I've discovered that if you go to that website today, it takes you to Amazon. It takes so you he, to Amazon. He never let it go. And I'm, I literally, I was like, you know what? It can't get any, the book can't get any better. So like, I, I was like, I'm, but then I was like, no, I better read it because I got to do this panel thing. Um, <clears throat> but the the... To me, when I look back at Amazon, and as a, the, the reason I'm impressed is because it's, you know, drop the dot com. It is an absolutely unrelenting pace of innovation, frankly, on behalf of a customer led by somebody who's ready to cannibalize the S team member on his left with the new initiative with the S team member on their right. And he basically says, you figure it out. Do we, do we have any contrarian views? Has, has Amazon gotten smaller in any of your esteem as, as you guys have been out of the organization? I think in my memory, uh, actually when I was at Amazon, I, I loved the company so much and I still do. And it was by far the best experience of my life because there's no question about it. But once I left Amazon and I looked at the world around, um, there are limitations to e-commerce shopping. And Amazon will have to figure out how to break it because it is very limiting. It is a good experience, but it's not the great experience. And uh, the more I thought about it, is, uh, uh, the more I had a bigger vision that it is, it is beatable. It is actually very, very beatable because the three-dimensional experience or experience your mobile experience combined with your three-dimensional experience in-store is richer. So is a traditional e-commerce or Amazon, is it beatable? It is. So the more, the further away I got from it, the bigger picture I saw, it helps. I still love Amazon for everything, and I will continue shopping there for printer cartridges, <laughs> for apparel, for jewelry, for many other product categories, not so much. I'm beginning to think that maybe Nadia isn't funded by Amazon secretly. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a ruse. 
Um, okay, so I'll, I'll add one thing <laughs> sure. though, to, um, just in terms of the um, what I actually do think is a risk of Amazon, and this uh, this this could really hurt my funding. Just yeah. so you know, um, I think that. See, Amazon, I mean, the S team, if you look at like Jeff's direct reports, many of those individuals have been with the company for many, 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 many years, you know, like 10 years, 11 years, 12 years, 13 years, et cetera. And then you look at the, you know, huge bottom of the triangle and it's essentially if you walk down, you know, in South Lake Union, you know, it's, they're 22. Pre it's pretty much a college campus. I mean, they're, you know, they're very young, you know, either college recruits or college recruiting. Um, and I think that, in order for Amazon to scale, and I think it will become a more and more of a challenge, and that is development of what I would call that middle layer of talent. Um, you know, I mean, frankly, you know, I was a GM, so I was like in the middle. I, I call it like the, you know, the, the sandwich, <laughs> call it a shit sandwich, but I don't, we can edit that out. Um, <clears throat> But Those that, are my kids. exactly, you know, that middle layer of managers where you're, you know, required to have a, a conversation with Jeff and defend a business, and at the same time, you're supposed to go on a campus recruiting trip to, you know, hire the, the top crop, you know, CS grads from, you know, Waterloo, MIT, et cetera. Amazon's risk, frankly, is the I think the, the kind of lack of employee development or the, the rigor around how to truly develop employees into next generation leaders two or three levels up. And if they don't do that, what ends up happening is, you know, you, you're just going to end up with an S team and you're going to end up with a high churn rate, but a, you know, a, a group of individuals that have been there for 20, 25 years. So I think a, a strategic risk for Amazon is how to how to continue to grow at the pace that they're growing, but more importantly, put these middle tier managers in place that can truly help kind of exponentially grow the you know, employee base below them. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a real challenge for them. Um, and when I think of, it made me think of it, when I think of like you know, Amazon being beat, you know, that's, that's a real, that's a, it could be a real challenge for them because you know, not every single idea is gonna come from the S team. And, not, you know, and a lot of ideas are gonna come from, you know, one year, two year, three year, you know, employees, but somebody has to help them package their ideas or their level of innovation and excitement to be presented to those, you know, to the S team. And that doesn't always happen. You get a lot of people who just quit because they're like, well, shit, I had a great idea, but it's like, I don't know who to talk to, you know, or, you know, my VP just left. And so now I'm, you know, now I'm kind of VP less. Um, so I, I think that Amazon, um, the culture, Jeff, I do think there needs to be an investment in the culture around nurturing and growing employees from within as opposed to just simply, you know, you, you did some great work and so now you get promoted. So I'd take a counterpoint to that because that was actually one of the reasons I left, right? So, and, and I don't know if I totally disagree with you uh, by any stretch, cause, but, but what I would say is that as I've left, I, I would agree or more with your earlier statement that as I've gotten further away, it's hard to argue with the results, right? It's really, really tough to argue with the results. And I've chosen for my company to take a different stance, because I, but, but then I reflect on my experience. So I, 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 in a year that Amazon was supposed to make 135, $140 million, I helped them hit $200 million. Mm -hmm. So I, I dropped $50 million to the bottom line, and I got a $55,000 raise. Mm -hmm. And I did that against Jeff Bezos's with. Will. Right, right, right. I fought him tooth and nail. I fought every executive at the company to get a project through, and it fundamentally changed their finances in 2003 and changed their finances in 2013. And I got a $50,000 raise, and I was like, really? That's, that's the ball game, right? And, you know, and I left and created Redfin the next week, which will do three and a half right, billion this year, right? right? And, and, and so I'm part of that, that leak in, in a mm -hmm. sense because I wasn't able to get rewarded. I had an, a, a boss that I didn't particularly like. Um, and, and I fought with all the time and I, when I wasn't growing and I wasn't getting rewarded for it and I could make more money somewhere else. But at the same time, I don't know that for Amazon, that's gonna make them lose. I, I, and, I, and I've come to just kind of respect yeah, the result while I disagree, I do fundamentally disagree that I don't wanna ingrain that in my company. I, I don't know that I can judge them and say that it's a fault on their side. Like I've come to really respect right. the cohesion right. of that, all of the decisions as they come together. I, I, I think, I mean, I. It very well, I think, could be somewhat dependent on the group, but for me, it's just, if you look at the size and the scale and the pace of where they're headed, you know, you can't, 
you can't, you can't, you can't look like you're going to be the next Walmart or GE without you know 150, you know 200,000 employees, and say that your best people are either you know 250,000 strong at the bottom and nine at the top, and the people in between are just kind of like, you know, it, like. Are they there still? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, it just it just doesn't scale. I think it works, you know, in probably certain businesses where it may be smaller. But I do think at some point that middle tier, that middle management tier, at the point that you're a hundred billion, 150, 200 billion dollar company with 150,000 people, you got to have some kick-ass VPs. You got to have some kick-ass GMs. Like, but true to form, wouldn't you guess that this is the way that I would guess Amazon's going to learn that lesson? They're going to go zero, 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 test, test wins, and then 100% like the next But day. what's the test? Well, let's agree to revisit this oh, conversation. Sorry, sorry. No, no, in five years, and we'll know. I mean, so I think you you're both making great points. Now I feel like I'm back at frickin' Amazon. Like, now, <laughs> no, I like this. How this the hell is, did this happen? This is disagree and commit. <laughs> this is good, but we're, we're, I, I, I'm interrupting because I want to go to questions soon. I'm going to ask one more question, so start thinking of what you want to ask this great panel. And I want to uh, go to Christina, and I want you all to tell me about the day that you decided to leave Amazon and, and was that a relief or was it a difficult decision? Yeah, wow. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. It was, um, you know, the truth is that I was so invested in the business I was in. At the time, I was leading marketing for our, our product advertising programs. And I set my end date based on, I basically wanted to have a backfill before I left because I know how painful it is when you leave a business trapped. It's so difficult to hire when you're constantly raising the bar. And so, uh, well, my anticipated end date kind of kept getting pushed out and out and out. Um, but I think, you know, on, on the last day, it was really tough. Um, it was just so much a part of my identity. It was every conversation I had, like literally things would be happening in the world, and I knew nothing about them. What I knew about was what was on the internet and what was on my calendar <laughs> for the day. Um, and it just really, it was, it was a really difficult day when I, I handed in my badge. You know, my badge I'd worked so hard for. Um, at Amazon, if, if you're there for five years, uh, you, you, everyone has a blue badge. Um, and if you're there for five years, you get a yellow square around it. And for 10, you get a red square. And I had a yellow square. And I was very proud of it. And I had to, I took a photo of it and I, I passed it up. And, and I, I walked through the campus, you know, kind of like with my bag not carrying a laptop. And it was really tough. I mean, I honestly, I, I was teary. Nadia, you, you ha have a family connection to Amazon. You're on the S team. What does is, what is leaving feel like? Uh, I'm an idiot. I was an idiot. Um, so uh, it was a very difficult decision because I don't know about thirty or $50,000. They were paying me a shitload of money. And uh, uh, life was extremely good. We were moving very fast. We were innovating every day. I loved every minute of it. Um, I just had the startup itch. And uh, many people in the audience know what it is. And once you get that startup itch, you just have to do it. And so I left uh, a gazillion dollars on a table and a great office and the best job in the world. And I ended up in a basement of my house. And the day after, I woke up and I thought, oh my god, what am I doing? And that was a very tough day, but after that, everything just worked out as magic. And uh, I miss Amazon a lot, but I'm just having it every day. I'm having such a good time. It is so exciting. It is, uh, it is growing. It is changing the people, the way people shop. It's changing the retail. I'm just the happiest person in the world. I'm happier now than I was at Amazon, but I miss Amazon. I do. I would go back one day. Sully, it doesn't seem like you, uh, there, there was too much hand-wringing on your part. And you were at Amazon during a particularly difficult time. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, man, I, when I left, um, uh, it's, it's, it's two dates. There's the day I decided to leave, uh, which is the, the day that I realized my boss was not going to go away. So I'd been through six bosses in, um, uh, I want to say, like 18 months at this point. Um, and so, and it appeared that this guy was not going to go away, and I, I did not like him. And um, and so I had brought an issue to him that I needed resolved in order to get the, the this advertising thing started. And he was like, you know, just go focus on what you're supposed to. And I was like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is how I get paid. 
and, uh, and he's like, you know, I just don't really want to hear about it. I want to micromanage some, what your team is doing today. And, um, and I was like, that sounds awesome. And um, we, call, we called my one-on-ones with him the Eye of Sauron. And, um, uh, and I'm not joking, by the way. We still call it the Eye of Sauron because I work with all my coworkers from Amazon. I hired them all, so I, they all work with me now. I'm, I'm now the Eye of Sauron, by the way, in case you, you don't get the extension of that joke. Um, and, uh, and I remember I, I ran down the, I, I walked down the hall and I just took my notebook and I threw it as hard as I could at my coworker's door and I just said, I am effing out of here. Wow. And uh, so that was the day I decided to leave. Um, the, the day that I actually did leave was, was much cooler, which is that, so I decided to leave that day. So then before I left, I wanted to have somewhere to land. So I built Redfin. And so I launched Redfin. It's an online real estate company yeah, based so in Seattle. And uh, we launched that, and we had 400,000 visitors on the first day. We had, like, literally, you know, a huge percentage of all Seattle people in the world. You couldn't go to a Starbucks in Seattle and not see Redfin. In fact, Amazon was going to acquire Redfin and didn't quite know what they were acquiring at the time. Um, And uh, so then I quit and did that. So I was very, very happy when I quit. Dave, your last day at Amazon. Uh, Yeah, I I mean, I, uh, I, I... I, I cuss a lot, so I'm trying not to say that F word because I keep I keep wanting to say it. Uh, I I really love that place. I mean, I, I f and love that place. I thought it was super super slick. I uh, God, the people were so smart and like I, I it was just really it was an awesome awesome gig. And you know, frankly, I I ended up leaving um, because I was going through a divorce, and it was frankly just impossible for me to concentrate mentally on what I was asked to do at Amazon while at the same time go through a divorce. I had three daughters, not have, I have uh, three daughters and I just couldn't, I, I couldn't actually do, I couldn't do my job. I couldn't do my job at the bar frankly that I needed to and it was a, uh, it was weird because my, you know, my last day I remember kind of walking out. We had just moved. Uh, we were the first group to move to uh, South Lake Union, or our, actually, I think we were the second building. Um, and I remember kind of walking out, and it was a very. It was actually kind of emotional because, on one hand, um, and I, I cried a little. You know, on one hand, I was very, was really sad that I was leaving because I had really. I mean, I really fell in love with like the people that I worked with. I mean, I really, really enjoy the people. Uh, but on the other hand, I also realized that I had no choice. That I, I couldn't, you can't be distracted. You, you just kind of can't. I mean, Christina talked about never seeing the outside world. Well, you can't. It's really, really difficult, or at least it was for me, you know, to go through a divorce and try to concentrate on Amazon. So when I left, um, it felt like, you know, I was pulling myself out of the game. Um, and it was a game that I really, really liked, but I, you know, I had a, tor- you know, torn hamstring and a broken collarbone, and I couldn't play. Hopefully, not injuries sustained. No, at but Amazon. I mean, it was right. But it was just one of those like I want to play this game, but I can't. I'm mentally injured. So it sounds like Nadia, you can see yourself maybe one day boomeranging and ending up back there. You know, I, I don't know. It's it's funny because um, the thing that, the the thing that. After leaving Amazon, it kind of caused me to go into a series of kind of, you know, reflective states. And I I realized that, you know, I really do like innovation. I like starting things up and, you know, all the cool things that Amazon has to offer kind of from a technology and product or innovation perspective. But I also realized that I really like my family and I really like my daughters. And so, you know, the, the, the simple answer for me was to basically start a company, take some of the money that I made from Amazon, start a company that essentially now kind of combines, you know, love of technology and starting things up while at the same time is focused on the family and gives me a work-life balance that, you know, works well with, you know, being divorced and girls going back and forth between two houses. So, you know, I, I think the place is, you know, and I'm not just saying this because, you know, they gave me money. I, I cash their checks. Um, it's cool. But it's, it's a damn good place. And if I ever get a shot to go back there again, like legitimately, I'd strongly consider it would be nice to buy Amazon one day. What's that? <laughs> it would be nice to buy Amazon one day. I think it would be very day. interesting to take money from Amazon <laughs> ST members and turn around and buy them. Okay. That's an interesting Grandiose book. ambitions. <laughs> um, well, I uh, should get to have all the fun here, so I would like to invite you guys to ask questions of our excellent audience. And I believe we have some microphone runners. Um, so why don't we start uh, <laughs> over there? Uh, yes, sir. Yep. 
you square the market value of Google at 342 billion versus the market value of Amazon at 151 billion? And like almost no profits in Amazon with massive amounts of profits on Google. It's the, it's the proverbial and almost constant question about Amazon. You know, why, why, considering that it has lost money now in three of the last four quarters, uh, you know, despite excellent revenue growth, why are, why are shareholders so bullish on Amazon? Does anybody want to play uh, kind of Wall Street? Okay, I'm sorry. Compared to Google, Google has a valuation of 340, massive profits, much younger company. Amazon has a valuation of 150 billion, almost no profits. What's going on? How do we on? square the two valuations? Yeah, I mean, what's going on? How come, you, yeah. how come they can make profit? I mean, when is it going to start making profit, if ever? I love the company, by the way, but why? <laughs> well, I mean, I'd say, you know, Amazon has showed its ability to, to make a profit, particularly in 2010, 2011, when Amazon Prime took off. And then they just have very consistently telegraphed all their moves. So they have told their shareholders that they're entering into a growth phase and they're building fulfillment centers uh, and they're getting into hardware and they're expanding internationally. And, and, and nothing's been a surprise. And, and part of it is, I mean, obviously there's an element of irrationality, but it's the credibility that they've gotten by calling their shots and, and the fact that Jeff is the founder operator. You know, people just believe in the guy and I, it doesn't always make sense. And we'll see if the confidence starts to waver. But I think, you know, what, the optimism, particularly compared to Google, is, is the fact, you know, is the history of the company. The fact that, you know, they almost died during the bust and, and then built an incredible business, and they have the track record uh, you know, that, that has inspired uh, a little bit of fervor, per particularly among their long-term institutional shareholders. I, I think one thing, too, about the stock, because you know, people talk about it a, a lot also internally, is there's, a, um, you know, there, there's kind of a, a belief of inevitability that I think goes into Amazon in particular. And what I mean by that is, you know, you look at Google and you look at, you know, several different business adventures or lines of businesses that they've extended, and they kind of haven't done super, super great. They've got, you know, a couple of core business and core revenue streams. And then you look at Amazon and you're like, holy cow, they actually, you know, launch a cloud computing business to compete against, you know, IBM, et cetera. They've got, you know, North American and international retail. They've got what they're doing with, you know, digital devices delivery. You look at what they're doing with Kindle. And you kind of have to ask yourself, where does it stop? I mean, you know, you, you buy the stock because you assume that it's going to go up in valuation and that while there's, you know, fundamentally no correlation between the stock price and the fundamentals, you kind of ask yourself though, where is it going to stop? Like what is, I mean, I, I have a friend who actually worked at Amazon for many years, hasn't sold a single share and he is worth a, a pretty darn good penny. We were chatting like, when does it stop? Because I would have said 10 years ago, but it'll, you know, boy, it'll stop here, or maybe it'll stop with books, but where, where does it stop? And I think there's, that's what makes, in my opinion, one thing very unique about Amazon that I do think factors into the stock. People buy into the stock because it doesn't appear that there's anything stopping them. Okay, I want to get to as many questions as possible, so let's go to the next one, yes. Um, yes, when, when any of you left Amazon, did Jeff Bezos actually say thank you for the contribution that you made to Amazon? I'm sorry. I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, that's a great, all right. that's a great so, question. And a little follow-on. Uh, to the degree your follow-on startups become, are already or become hugely successful, would, would he be the kind of person that would ever say, you know, good job, that's great, congratulate you on that? Did anybody have any uh, parting discussions or parting lunches with Jeff? Nadia? I cannot tell you that, sorry. Oh, we can't, we can't go there. Oh, jeez. I know that, that uh, for many years he, he would do that. He would take some time to meet with departing executives. What about the, the second part of the question? You think if, uh, you know, if, if uh, he noticed, you know, Rich Relevance's success, uh, if you guys, you know, raise another round of funding or, or file to go public, um, at some point in the future, you know, would you hear from him? So, so I'll, I'll answer a slightly different question. The answer is no. 
um, you know, not, not probabilistically, but pretty deterministically would be my guess. Um, <laughs> Uh, the the one thing I will share though, on a, you know, it's one thing to kind of corner the guy and, and, and put him in one sense. You know, when I worked there, I uh, I grew up in a real small town, about uh, fifteen thousand people in Oregon, and uh, a little, little town called Grants Pass. And, and there, all the businesses there, are, you know, four hundred, five hundred people, and so everybody knows everybody. So my mom just assumed that I was either the CEO or you know, at, at this time we had probably thirty thousand employees or was really closely interacting with him on a daily basis. And I reported to him for a little while, but not, not that closely interacting. And so she would send him an email about my personal life. Oh, that's awesome. Probably eh, once a week, maybe, maybe, maybe more frequently sometimes. Um, and, and he was really cool about it. You know, and I kind of expected to get the big question mark email with a, you know, kind of commentary add-on from HR with the, with the final check and whatnot. And he was like totally cool, and he knew about it, and he knew it was me. And when we had our meetings, he'd be like, you know, tell your mom thanks, and let off any time. But uh, so you know, I mean, there there was kind of a, a little bit of a personal side to him. I thought that was kind of cool. Awesome. Next question. Um, I actually have two different questions. You can answer either one or both if you feel like it. Uh, one is about how Jeff's other involvements in things like, uh, you know, Blue Origin or the the Long Now Foundation with the Clock of the Long Now, or more recently uh, the Washington Post, whether these represent part parts of kind of his psyche or of the culture of Amazon that that resonate to you, or if if these are kind of surprising interests of his. Um, to the people on the panel. And the other is just um, about the news today that the, um, the threshold for the super saver shipping was going from 25 to 35, which I thought was a, a pretty interesting, in one case, retreat from a focus on delighting the customer. And so is this a move towards profitability? Is it a retreat from the things that make Amazon great? Or is it just a sound business choice? Hmm. Nadia, do you want to take the first question to start off? Was, yeah. were, were, were any members of the S team ever, uh, yeah. you know, did they find it disconcerting that Jeff's doing all these other things? So uh, all, all of those things make perfect sense. Uh, Jeff is very passionate about space and about space program. He has been for many years. Uh, so his uh, thinking and his investment in, in that area just matches his personal curiosity. Uh, if you go to his house, it's... Uh, um, he has uh, an old engine from, from a spaceship and uh, a cosmonaut suit and books about Gagarin, who was the first Russian um, uh, space astronaut. And he just very, very, he cares a lot about space. He knows an awful lot about it. He talks about it all the time. And so all his investments there made perfect sense. Um, his uh, Washington Post investment made perfect sense too because um, Jeff is changing the way we read. And if you think about paper, that is one thing which is not great yet. Uh, if you get your Kindle in the morning, the experience of reading a paper is good, it's not great. So uh, his uh, uh, obsession with the way we read and changing the way we read and uh, his obsession with making that perfect, if you think about it in that context, that acquisition makes perfect sense. So that's, that's, I think, we'll see amazing things from paper reading experience from him. And I'll take a shot at the second question. I, I mean, I, know, I think Amazon has some rationalizations for rising uh, the threshold on super saver shipping. You know, they, they say they've added a lot of products to qualify for the program. They want to incentivize customers to join Amazon Prime and get all the extra benefits. But ultimately, it seems to me that you know, shipping costs were, were, were spiraling and, and that they're adjusting one of the levers. And so I think th that's actually not true. So shipping costs are going down. And the way they're going down is because uh, the fulfillment centers are getting closer and closer to customers. So if you look at Amazon Geography, where it started with one central Kentucky location, it went down closer and closer to customers. So shipping costs are going down. So that is not true. But it seems like from the quarterly reports, overall shipping costs are going up. But what it is, is uh, uh, there is an amazing program, which is Amazon Prime, which becomes richer and richer. And uh, it... Um, I think making Amazon Prime so appealing that you really have to be an idiot not to join it 
is where what will happen. It's a migration strategy. Okay, excellent. Next question. One thing uh, Jeff Bezos has talked about publicly and he told me is regret minimization is kind of a critical decision criteria for him. And that's, and that, in fact, the critical, you know, regret, minimize your regrets. How does that play out actually in Amazon? And is that just something he says or how does that play in day in and day out at Amazon in action? Well, I think that, um, that that's part of, you know, his willingness to take risks. You know, he says if you want to invent, you have to be willing to fail. And I think that's the thing, you know, if Jeff has an idea, uh, essentially, you know, he deploys a, a team of incredibly smart people to go out and, you know, determine if it has legs. So I think, um, you know, it's kind of part and parcel um, there, you know, there's so many famous cases of Amazon trying things that haven't succeeded and, um, you know, one of the things I worked on, the, there was a, a small website called Endless.com where we tried to curate a better experience mm -hmm. shopping for apparel, but we didn't quite get to the level that I think Pointer is going to take us to. Um, and it was a really interesting experiment and, and we all learned a lot doing it, um, you know, but it was one of those things like it didn't prove out, you know, at the end of the day, so we cut it and, you know, Endless is no longer. Um, but yeah, I think that, that regret minimization is, is part of it. It's, it's part of the, hey, I have an idea. I don't want to regret not doing it. If someone else did it and I had thought of it and they you know, wound up being successful, um, I think Jeff would have a really difficult time with that. Next question. So it sounds like the culture at Amazon and the culture at, for example, a place like Zappos is pretty different. And I'm just wondering, um, what happened to the culture of the places that were purchased and was there a specific way that um, uh, the entities that were merged in got merged in um, either to uh, become Amazonia or not? Well, it seems like Zappos has remained fairly independent uh, while, while subsequent acquisitions have been merged, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, it, I think it depends, <clears throat> I think it depends on, on how, to your point, I think it's how the acquisition actually, you know, is is, is fused to, to the mothership, for lack of a better word. I mean, so running the associates program um, was interesting because we had associates is the affiliate marketing program, but we had all these you know companies that we had acquired that also had affiliate marketing programs. So you know, our one of the things that you know our job was to really think about running the affiliate marketing programs for them. So you had a lot of an opportunity to talk to these other firms, and I think that if a place stayed independent. I kind of got the sense that you know their culture for the most part was preserved and frankly you know they were given a reasonable amount of autonomy um, to run if you landed in you know Pac Med you know Columbia Tower or you know now South Lake Union you know you 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 now are going to become an Amazonian um, I mean you, you can't you know, you can't, you kind of can't not. It's just, it's the, it is the environment, it's the, it's the swamp, it's the pool you're in, it's the uniform you wear, and it just, it just kind of is the case. And I had a, some friends who have had companies that had been acquired, and it, it was hard. It was really hard. You know, small seven, eight person teams get bought, looks really good, pretty excited, come to Amazon, you know, in the mothership, and it, it, it's kind of jarring. Um, you know, some of them got used to it in time, but it certainly is a very different place. So I think if you remain independent, I think that it's it's a very different kind of atmosphere versus, you know, if you're I wonder I wonder if Zappos eventually, when current management turns over, if, if they ultimately get more integrated into the whole. So Zappos is very integrated. It's Zappos pretty, is not In terms of culture, though, to, to Stephanie's point, it's, it's radically different, right? It's... Yeah. <laughs> They're, they're, they're still uh, flying Tony's flag yeah. in uh, Las Vegas, no? Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, but I think what we've done is we looked at the best things about Zappos and we tried to integrate it the other way around into Amazon's culture. So uh, the best innovations from Zappos, we certainly looked very, very carefully and we applied it to our warehouses worldwide and we applied it to our culture worldwide and we uh, tried many different experiments from the best of Zappos to apply to the rest of the company. It worked really well for us. But the cultures are pretty distinct. I mean, th there's some business learnings and integrations that have happened, you know, kind of under the scenes. But if you're like, the employee, I mean, in the culture day in and day out, I think they're, they're pretty. You can get a tour of they're, Zappos' they're pretty offices, and when you walk through, all the employees stand up and clap. They're pretty d different. I don't, I don't know that Amazon <laughs> will be starting that anytime soon, although that'd be fun. 
Next question, please. Yes. All of you have touched on you know, how, what a great place it was to uh, work in terms of the brilliance of other employees and how smart and intelligent they were. Uh, can you talk about how, what kind of hiring practices they used to get, to get the, that kind of talent and also how fast would they fire someone if, it didn't work, if somebody didn't work out? Anybody want to handle that one? Uh, so on firing even? very fast, Fire, yep. uh, you have a few months. Uh, on, uh, and so we'll look very carefully on the bottom 10% and uh, see what makes sense for us and we'll fire, we'll let people go very, very fast. Um, and on the hiring, the principle is very simple. You have to find a person who is smarter than you are and uh, you get together with six or eight other Amazonians and uh, uh, the person who've been interviewed has to be smarter than all of them. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a funny way of hiring but it actually really works because first of all, it's really good to be Amazonian early on because then you can be the dumbest one and still do really well. Um, and uh, sec and uh, you're not afraid of that at all, of hiring people who are much smarter than you are. And uh, uh, second, it's, uh, it sets a bar really high and it's really fun to work because you get really good people around you. And if you're a manager, that's really good because then if you hire a lot of really smart people, you look really smart. That's like, <laughs> This is a great way to make a really, really good career at Amazon. Thank you. We have a couple more minutes, so let's try to get to a few more questions. Do we have somebody? Oh, are we a retap? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, wait one sec for the microphone. Can you talk about uh, Jeff technology expertise? Because if you look at Amazon, they make business decisions as well as technology decisions, right? You know, does he have a uh, good understanding of technology or who makes a technology decision at Amazon? Uh, he has a very good, very deep understanding of technology and mathematics. And uh, he will go down to the lowest, lowest level of detail. Um, if it's uh, a mathematical paper which talks about a supply chain, he would go down to the last formal and he will spend four hours understanding it and he will get it. Uh, so he is. Uh, uh, he's very curious himself, so in uh, that curiosity is around the technology. So he knows uh, the internals of AWS business down to the lowest level of detail, and he knows the internals of uh, uh, of Amazon's technologies, and he will dig and dig and dig and dig and dig until he he totally knows it inside out. So when I when I was there, we used to get these little plaques, and you'd file for a patent, and and. Um uh, every single one of those that I filed for, I ended up having a, I, I had to defend it against the, the law firm. I didn't justify it to them. And then you had this incredibly high hurdle, which is that before they would actually file it, so they'd write it all up, and you had to def I had to defend all my patents against Jeff. I don't know if, it, if you guys had that same experience, but um, so every single one of the patents that I filed there, I had to defend against him, and he was always much, much harder than, than the lawyers. Um, and all the patents that we filed were in the space of, of machine learning, right, which at the time was, was pretty, you know, so actually a lot of what we did was mm -hmm. based on Russian mathematicians, which is kind of funny, you referred mm -hmm. back to that. Um, and, uh, and he would, I don't know that he would understand the exact math of every single thing that we're doing, but every single concept that we presented, I had a team of, you know, mostly PhDs that reported to me, and they would have to interact directly with him in defending every one of the decisions that we made in the patent every step along the way. So um, I, I think that's a pretty big yes for me. Yeah, I think there are things which, interests him deeply and then there are things which don't interest him at all and the technology and mathematics is uh, or space or reading innovation those are the things which interest him very very deeply so he will spend a lot of time and energy on uh, going down to the level of detail but there are many other things which he doesn't care at all about and then he won't spend a minute on it we might have time for one more question do we have one yes ma'am So just because you just talked about how he was so interested in uh, technology and math specifically, I'm curious because I read something Brad wrote about PR and press coverage and then I'm curious how the turn in marketing and advertising happened because I understand how decisions based purely on data can be made, but marketing is more of an emotional I'll thing, right? I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I was in marketing. So, you know, my, our group, the, the last two, a couple of years of my group, we were in marketing, which was not called marketing, it was called worldwide traffic. 
Um, and then the decisions were data driven. So you kind of had, I mean, essentially you had categories and you had a certain revenue number that you wanted to achieve per category. And so there would basically be a certain dollar figure of spend that Scutac and Wilkie and Bezos would be comfortable comfortable with spending, and then from there you would essentially break it down into what channels you wanted to spend on, and all the channels essentially had to have pretty much trackable or at attributed you know, pieces to them to determine if in fact they actually made money. So only very recently around Kindle was it the very first time where like say television advertising took place and even radio and we were just experimenting. Everything else was, you know, really, here's the dollar figure from a percent or a hard number in terms of how much we're going to spend on marketing. You then essentially distribute that in terms of how much you're going to send at a category level, which then in turn is what makes the most sense on a channel basis, whether it's paid advertising, whether it's Amazon Associates paid in referral fees, whether it's, you know, all the very kind of structured, you know, I guess channels. Um, and only recently, and Jeff didn't like television advertising. It, just, it was so uncomfortable because the measurements were so imprecise. Um, he didn't like radio, but I think people convinced them that there was a brand element that you know, could be beneficial, but that's just not his DNA. Um, the kinds of marketers, frankly, at Amazon, they're quant marketers. You know, they're individuals who've worked at like, you know, I don't know, you know, Discover Card or, you know, in the, you know, direct mail programs like Time Warner, like it's, you know, massive kind of one to many programs, highly measurable, lots of data so that you can determine the fluctuation. And in Jeff's case, because everything was digital, you could constantly review the effectiveness or the efficacy of those. And he would want to know like cannibalization, like if, you know, investments in, you know, SEO versus paid advertising are there cross cannibalization issues. So the brand element that we typically use with marketing is I think a new thing for Jeff. He still is much more comfortable with his dollars being spent on things that are trackable uh, at a very specific and precise level. You know, actually I don't think that uh, Amazon advertisement is about branding. It is about getting the piece of information out so if you look at many, many commercials, it's not about getting you a warm feeling. It's about letting you know about something very specific. Yeah, and I think for those specific things, uh, advertising makes perfect sense, even a TV advertising. If you have something very specific, like you, know, you now have a much better help from Amazon by clicking on this button, and you can get a person, live person on the phone to give you support. That is a piece of information. So if you look at many new latest Amazon commercials, they're not about giving you a warm feeling. They're about give, letting you know what's new. And by the way, just to close out, I recently, I'm a Prime member, I recently received a letter in the mail, I think was sent to all Prime members, advertising Amazon's new video offering. So even, even a channel uh, that perhaps uh, he uh, had very little faith in, they're willing to experiment and try new things. Let's give a big round of applause to our panel. This is great. I'd like to thank our speakers for sharing their insights and perspectives so freely. You were awesome, Dave, Sally, Nadia, Christina, Brad, for leading the conversation so masterfully. Please accept this Churchill Club speaker t-shirt as a symbol of our gratitude. I don't think we'll ever see it on Hointer, but maybe we'll see it on the CEO of Hointer. <laughs> right? Thanks again to our program partner and sponsor, Bloomberg Business Week. A recording of this program will be available next week on our YouTube channel, should be. And for your convenience, copies of Brad's book, The Everything Store, are available for purchase in the uh, registration area, and the author will be here for a short while to personalize your copy, if you wish. So you have been a terrific audience. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Good night. Thank you very much.